Matthew chapter 5, verse number 1, and let's just begin reading uh, uh, here uh, again this evening. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set down, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The beatitude that we're going to look at this evening is found in verse 4. Let's look at it once more. In fact, I invite you to say it out loud together with me. Are you ready? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This morning we started what we understand to be the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is sitting on a hillside on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he is teaching the crowds with great authority. As mentioned this morning, his message is in strong opposition against the philosophies and the teachings of the religious groups that existed in that day. We may not have these same groups by definition, in the world in which you and I live in, but they certainly exist in mentality. They are the Pharisees, the traditionalists, the Sadducees, the modernists, the Essenes, who are the separatists, the zealots, who are the activists. Everything that Jesus is teaching here in these three chapters, chapter 5, 6, and 7, is in great opposition against the mentality of the religious thinking of Jesus' day. The same is true even in the setting in which you and I sit in this evening. His sermon begins with the Beatitudes. And as we have already pointed out, these eight pronouncements seem paradoxical because they promise, or excuse me, rather, what they promise in relation to what they demand is unnatural to the unregenerate mind. They say here, blessed, happy are the uh, poor in spirit, happy are the mourn, happy are they that are meek, and so on and so forth. And then the, the, the promise for the demand are things such as comfort and the kingdom of God and the, and the filling of the Lord. The second beatitude brings out this point clearly for what could be more contradictory to the world's perspective and the idea that the path to joy, happiness, and blessing is through sadness, sorrow, and mourning. It's exactly what Jesus is saying. Blessed, happy, uh, joyful are they that mourn, are they that are sad, are they that are sorrowful, for they shall be comforted. Again, I must point out that these are characteristics that one only possesses if he is a true child of God. Let us not buy into this mentality that I can just put these in front of me and work toward these goals in my own merit or strength. That's simply not the case. Those who belong to Christ's kingdom have a different quality of character from those who are outside the kingdom. And that's what Jesus is saying here. That citizens of God's kingdom will be comforted, will inherit the earth, will seek the kingdom of heaven, even when it goes through the means, the path that is in full contradiction to what the world presents as true happiness and blessing. So what does it mean that the blessed life here in verse 4 is a life of mourning? Before I explain the nuances of this beatitude, let me begin by telling you what it does not mean. Now look at the beatitude again. Blessed are they that mourn. This does not mean that the follower of Christ is to live in a perpetual state of gloominess, all right? It's not what that means. 
After all, the scripture is very clear. Jesus said it himself, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus said, I came to give you a joyful life, a life of complete satisfaction, an abundant life. Listen, this is not a life that we are to simply endure. This is a life that we are to enjoy. And we enjoy it through the blessing of Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes is very clear. There are times of different seasons of life. There is a time to weep, and there is a time to laugh. What's he saying? That in the will of God, God has given us a life of complete joy. So it does not mean, it cannot mean, that citizens of the kingdom of God are to live in a perpetual state of gloominess. That we're to walk around so serious all the time with with nothing good or positive to say. That we can't laugh and enjoy the things that God has given us. That is simply not so. But to experience this abundant, joyful life in Christ, there is first a mourning, a sorrow, a, a sadness that must be a part of one's life. And that's what I want us to understand about this beatitude. Write down the first point there, the first statement in your notes. This morning is a godly sorrow over the darkness of sin. This morning is a godly sorrow over the darkness of sin. Blessed are they that mourn. Now, let me be very clear. The Lord is concerned about all the sorrow his children experience in this life. And he clearly invites us to bring those cares and those burdens to him where he will comfort us and strengthen us through his love and through his grace. But those kinds of sorrows are not what Jesus is addressing with the second beatitude. In fact, Jesus is speaking of a godly sorrow that is the direct result of acknowledging the seriousness of sin's presence and power. Of all the Greek terms used for our English word mourn in the Bible, and there is quite a few of them. In fact, in my study this weekend, I was able to just come around at least a dozen different Greek terms used in our New Testaments for the English word mourn. This one here is the word pentheo. It is the strongest and the most severe of all sorrows. It speaks of the deepest, most heartfelt grief and agony that one could ever feel. In fact, it is mostly associated with death in the Scriptures. It's the same mourning by which Jesus mourned over the loss of Lazarus temporarily in his life, and so on many other cases throughout the New Testament. So what Jesus is doing here is he's talking about a deep mourning, a mourning that is not just psychological, a mourning that is not just emotional. This morning here is a spiritual awakening to one thing, and that is man's complete depravity in sin. Now again, there's all kinds of sorrows that we face in life. And Jesus says, when you cast your care upon him, he is there to comfort. Let's not take away from that truth. But in the context of the Beatitudes, blessed, happy are those who are awake to their sin. Happy are those who have mourned over the depravity of their soul. For they will be comforted. I believe this mourning is first personal. It's seeing the darkness of my own sin. It's personal grief over my own unholiness toward God. You remember the moment in your life where you made that decision to forsake all and follow Jesus? Repentance is accompanied by a deep agony over personal sin. It's coming to the point where we recognize who we are outside of Christ. 
that our sin has separated us from God, that we were born this way because we were born in a state of depravity. It's in recognition that, that nobody has caused me to be in this place but my own sin nature. It's that grief, that darkness of my own personal sin, my own personal holiness to God, which is what pushes me toward the grace of a perfect God and a holy God who willingly opens his arms to me. Perhaps there's no better scene of this sorrow than when Paul speaks of his own sin in Romans chapter 7. In fact, let's look at that together. Hold your Bible there in Matthew chapter 5 and then flip over, if you would, just a few books to Romans chapter 7. You'll recognize the passage when we get to it here in just a moment, but I think it's important that we understand the nature of recognizing our own sin. How that this beatitude is dealing with the mourning of our own depravity. Romans chapter 7, find verse 14. This is Paul speaking here. Romans 7, 14. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. By the way, that is something that we must acknowledge before we can ever come to Christ. That there is none righteous, no, not one. That in me there is nothing good. Nothing good. There's no such thing as a good moral person who just happens to not be a Christian. No, there is none good. There is none righteous. He, he's acknowledging this. Dwelling in me is no good thing. Look at the rest of verse 18. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. I want to do good, but I don't know how to do good. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I don't want to do, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, that is my flesh, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You see this, this anthem by which Paul is declaring? He says, I want to do good, but I can't. I want to avoid evil, but I find myself giving in to evil. Why? Because I am depraved. Sin dwelleth in me. And as he's declaring this anthem, he just breaks out into this personal grief in verse 24. Look at it. Oh, wretched man that I am. What a terrible, sinful, wretched, depraved soul that I am. What's Paul doing here? He's crying, a cry of grief and sorrow over his own personal sin. Do you mourn over your own rebellion against God? I think it not only is a mourning over personal sin, I believe there is a mourning over sin also implied here that is broader than personal sin. It may be the sin of a church or perhaps the pervasive sins of a culture, both of which cause the citizens of God's kingdom to weep and mourn over sin's destructive force. You see, we are good at condemning sin, aren't we? But where is our mourning over sin? Where is our grief over the sins of a culture? No doubt we enjoy life. 
We laugh. We have a good time even in this own fellowship when we come together corporately week after week after week. But, but too much laughing, too much enjoyment, too much satisfaction even in a church setting is unhealthy and unspiritual. God's people are called to seasons of mourning over sin. Look at the book of Psalms. The majority of which are songs we are to sing to express both personal and corporate grief over man's depravity. Perhaps many of you saw the terrible news coming out of New York this week. You say, which one? The bad one. Where the New York Senate approved by vote of 38 to 24 the most egregious abortion privileges we've yet to see in our country. Perhaps if you haven't seen it, let me just go through the four main points. The vote allowed abortion to be added to the New York Constitution. It also allows non-physicians to practice the abortions. The third thing it did was that abortions are now legal in the state of New York to be carried out through the third trimester, all the way through nine months. And if you can get any worse, the fourth allotment is that it repealed protections for surviving babies. In other words, there will be no health benefits for babies born alive after a failed abortion in the ninth month mark. When the baby's brought out and is still breathing, he has no legal protections to be resuscitated. That just happened this week. Now, let me be clear. Abortion is murder whether it's carried out at nine weeks or nine months. But the darkness of this evil recently passed in the state of New York ought to bring us, God's people, to great sorrow and mourning. Yet, how did the legislators respond upon the news of these laws? Have you seen this? Let me show you about a 10-second clip. This was after the law was passed. Show this video and make sure the sound's up. They're cheering. They're applauding. What does that do to your soul? My wife and I were unable to have kids early in our marriage. Sometimes I wonder if we ever would. Some of you are in that same position. Wanting children. And we could go into the whole avenue of I don't want children. That's something you've got to work out between you and God and his own perfect will because that is clearly taught in Scripture. But those who want them and can't have them, and yet we've got legislators here in our country applauding the fact that now we can kill babies seconds before they're even born. And that's where we live. What does that do to our souls, our hearts? Yeah, pastor, it's just a culture. Now, Jesus said that the people of his kingdom mourn over sin. They mourn. Write down point number two. Not only is this mourning a godly sorrow over the darkness of sin, but this mourning is a result of being poor in spirit. This morning is a result of being poor in spirit. Now let me explain. The Beatitudes, as I mentioned this morning, they build on each other. That is, they're, they're, they're progressive in nature. C- consider the first one. No one gets into the kingdom of God who is not poor in spirit, acknowledging spiritual bankruptcy apart from God. And now we get to the second one because when one sees their spiritual poverty, it will produce within them a godly sorrow that mourns over that condition. In summary, here's what we mean. The poor in spirit mourn over their poverty. But the poor in spirit, when they acknowledge they're spiritually bankrupt, it grieves them. 
Of course, as we look deeper into God's Word each day of our life, we grow in our understanding of His complete holiness. And as we see the holiness of God, we begin to realize, realize just how unholy we are, and that realization doesn't produce a carefree feeling. He's holy, I'm not. Let's just keep going. No, no, when we begin to understand the depth of God's holiness, it produces within God's people, citizens of God's kingdom, this deep sense of both unworthiness and sorrow. That I don't deserve God's grace, that I could never be like God. I can never be holy like Him because of this depravity, this sin, this flesh in which I live. That's what Paul is saying. I want to be like God, but I can't be like God. I am sinful. There's no good thing in me. Do you remember Isaiah's encounter with the holiness of God? I know we're turning a lot tonight, but again, hold your finger in Matthew 5, flip back to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. Would help if I could find it myself. Isaiah chapter 6, here we are. Now, now look, at, look at verse number 1. This is a monumental scene here. In the year that King Ziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. That is, his glory filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two of them, they covered their face, with two of them, they covered their feet, with two of them, they flew. All right? To get this picture, he sees angels above the throne of God here in Isaiah 6. They have six wings. They're covering their face, they're covering their feet, and the remaining two, they're just flying above the throne of God. This is a view of heaven. This is a view of the temple room of God as it exists. And one, verse 3 cried to another and said this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. You want to know what the throne room of God looks like right now? That's exactly what it looks like. The seraphims flying above, covering their face because He is so holy. Covering their feet because they're, he, that God is so holy. And what are they singing? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, verse 4, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. The house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me. You ever seen something just phenomenal? Perhaps you visit a, a different country, a, a landmark, something that just blows your minds. And typically when we see those things, we're like, wow, would you look at that. It's beautiful. Pictures don't even give it justice. Wow. Isaiah is not saying, wow, would you look at that. He's saying, whoa. Whoa is me. For I am undone, verse 5. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I'm undone. I'm unclean. It's equivalent to what Paul was saying in Romans. said, I am wretched. You see, the mark of a mature Christian is not sinlessness. It's not. You can never achieve that. No, no, no. The mark of a mature Christian is a growing awareness of sinfulness. That I am undone that I am unclean, that I am unworthy of God's grace, that I do not deserve His love, that He is way more holy than I could ever dream of becoming in this life. It's the whole sentiment as my dad would often preach growing up as a child, which is a big mistake when you ever think that you think you've arrived. <laughs> because you'll never arrive until you arrive on the streets of gold. That is only the day that you'll become perfect and complete fully in Him. Martin Luther, when he nailed his 95 theses on the church in Wittenberg, Germany, one of them said this, 
The Christian's entire life is a continuous act of repentance and contrition. It's a great statement. The Christian's entire life is a continuous act of repentance and contrition. You might say, okay, we understand this, Pastor, but where's the happiness? Where's the blessedness? Well, let's consider this third and final part of the beatitude. Number three, not only do we see that this morning is a godly sorrow over the darkness of sin, that it's the result of being poor in spirit. Thirdly, the joy of God's comfort is reserved for those who mourn over sin. The joy of God's comfort is reserved for those who mourn over sin. It's quite simple. The mourner over sin will be comforted by God. How does he do this? Well, let's first see where godly sorrow leads us. You don't have to turn there, but let me read it to you. If you want to write it down in your notes for further study, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 says this. For godly sorrow, that's, that's the sorrow, the mourning that the second beatitude addresses. For godly sorrow bringeth repentance unto salvation. Godly sorrow, mourning, bringeth repentance unto Unto salvation. Think about it like this. I mentioned it a moment ago. Godly sorrow is always linked to the repentance of sin. And it is repenting of sin that brings God's grace of salvation. In other words, those who mourn over sin are happy because mourners over sin have their sins forgiven. And that is is the comfort by which Jesus speaks of in the second beatitude. Happy are the mourners over sin because God has comforted them through his forgiveness. Through his forgiveness. It's the comfort of his forgiveness, the comfort of his grace, the comfort of his salvation both now and forever, the comfort of Christ's atoning work for our sins. Mourning over sin brings forgiveness of sin, and forgiveness of sin brings joy and blessing that cannot be experienced any other way. It's why when we gather here week after week that our hearts fill up with joy when we sing the songs of redemption and when we read the scriptures of grace, when we think about the comfort of God's forgiveness because we realize that we are hell-bound, undeserving, depraved people who deserve the judgment of God, but yet God has brought us comfort Comfort through the mercy of his cross, the grace of his redemption. What about the comfort and mourning over the present sins of our culture? Well, citizens of God's kingdom, we realize that there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And though they may stand in a legislative hall and applaud such brutality in our country today, there will become a day that they will no longer applaud. They will no longer win what seems to be the constant policies of a nation that drifts further and further away from God. We are comforted by the fact that there is coming a day that all who stood in that room applauding will fall to their knees in agony claiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that brings great comfort to those who belong to Christ's kingdom because he is our victor and he is our God. That's why we can be happy no matter who's president. I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm not an Obama supporter. I'm not a Hillary supporter. I'm a Jesus supporter. Because my citizenship does not promote me to this country alone. I'm living for another kingdom. A kingdom whose policies will never be thwarted. A kingdom whereby everyone will kneel down in worship and glory to him. You see, we are comforted in our mourning by the fact that in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no more sin. In fact, the Bible says he wipes away all tears because there's no crying, there's no mourning in God's future perfect kingdom. So it is with joy and happiness and blessedness that no matter what goes on around us, we look toward the future of his kingdom. 
It's why Jesus said, as we will discover here before this Sermon on the Mount is concluded in chapter 6, that when we pray, that we ought to pray, thy kingdom come. Because we're strangers and pilgrims, as the old choir song says, just the passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I don't know if everything in that song is theologically correct. Probably not because we don't sing it here. But it is true. But we don't belong here. And that is why we can be happy even in times of mourning because we are comforted by God's grace. And we are comforted by the fact that Jesus will right the wrongs for all who's ever lived. I conclude with this. As often as we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive. Do you believe that? As often as we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive. And for as long as we mourn over sin, for as long as we mourn over sin, He's faithful to comfort. For blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. 